thank you that you are our source that everything that we need is found in you and you are freely willing to give father we ask that you prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us you withhold no good thing you're a good father Father, we just ask that you fill our hearts and our minds with your love and your goodness, that we would be able to see your hand in every situation, past and present, Father. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You've proven yourself faithful. We rest in that. We rest in our trust and our love for you and yours for us.
satisfies like you do. The fountain won't run dry. Nothing satisfies like you do. Yeah. 
glass resembling um, our lives a mess in an area and we're hiding it we're trying to shove it behind us sweep it behind us ashamed of it you know I broke something I messed something up I'm gonna hide it and I feel like God is saying I don't want you to hide that he's so full of love and mercy he's like hey come on let me see it let me see your your broken mess and you know those those beautiful stained glass windows that are literally formed from broken shards of glass and he's like look at what I can do with this if you'll give it to me if you'll give it to me look what I can do with it there's no shame in it and he takes the shame out of it and it's a beautiful display of what he's done in your life your testimony is nothing to be ashamed of. He's taking it and he's making it something beautiful. But you have to surrender the broken parts to him and not be ashamed of it, not try to hide it. He wants the whole thing, not a hidden piece. So, Father, we sing the rest of this song with our hearts and surrender to you. We surrender the whole thing, every hidden place, every part that we've been ashamed of, Father. You want the whole thing, and we give it freely. Because you make broken things beautiful. You make broken things beautiful. Yeah. Oh, my love, oh, my love, oh, my love, you can have it all. Oh, oh my love, oh, my love. Can have it all, all my heart. 
every ounce here broken at your feet and every breath is my offering my heart cries these lungs sing over you my worthy king of kings it's over you my worthy king of kings over you my worthy king of kings if you could keep playing sawyer when I read the story in the Word, it really is a powerful song when you think about the story of the alabaster jar and what it represented. And I want to paint a picture for you guys real quick. Um, the picture of this woman who, it's interesting because it's in a room full of people and Jesus is sitting at a table. And she takes this alabaster jar and the jar was actually over a year's worth of wages and the process of how to collect that perfume was an entire process in itself. And I want to just highlight the position of her heart in that moment and what that looked like. And she's coming down and she's bending over next to Jesus and she's pouring out this perfume on his feet and using her hair to clean up his feet and she's pouring it on his head. And think about the position of her heart. And what I love most about this is that around the table, people are watching. There's no background music. There's not, and the disciples and other people are watching in the room. And it's funny because the word says that they actually, the, the people at the table were scoffing, kind of like, what gives her the right? It actually says in the Bible that she, she's a sinner. What is she, who gives her the right to do that? Why would you even use that ointment, that perfume, for the reason that you're using it? And the, the, the thing I love the most about her heart is he, go, he goes, allow her to do what she's doing. Because the position of her heart was to honor above all else, and no matter what the opinion was in the room, his opinion was the only opinion that mattered, right? And so she's going, you're worthy. You're worthy. And she, I don't care where I stand, I'm pouring out my admiration, my love, and my compassion, and I acknowledge you for who you are and what you can do and what you've already done. And you're worthy of my praise. You're worthy of this wage. You're worthy of this perfume, and I pour it all out on you. And I'm thinking, man, is there anybody in this house today that isn't afraid of what anyone else thinks when it comes to don't allow somebody else to get in the way of what you believe about the Lord and what he's done in your life? Right, yeah. let nobody, I, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, sometimes I just stand and worship and that you just think like, what is everybody else thinking in this place? If we can't do it in here, where can we worship the Lord in boldness and passion? Right, And if somebody's not looking at your life going, what is up with this? Why the sacrifice? Why the commitment? Why the change? Why the passion? They should be looking at you going, there's something different about you. And your heart reflects something different. Why? Why? And I just want to encourage you today. He is worthy of getting on our knees and pouring out the perfume, the alabaster jar the wages, the hard efforts, all the things that we think we've done right, all the things that we've collected and we like to muster up and brag. So what have you achieved and accomplished in your life? It's not worth anything compared to knowing him and knowing who he is and allowing him to be Lord of our lives. And one thing I've learned, come on. One thing I've learned is it always requires sacrifice. We cannot be a disciple unless we're willing to forsake all. But the forsake all is always worth the surrender. It always comes with freedom. It always comes with a deeper, deeper revelation of who he is and what he's done. And it's powerful. And so this story is so beautiful when it comes to analyzing and stepping back and looking at our own hearts and going, am I willing to continue to pour out my life, my heart, my passions towards you? No matter what the cost looks like. And no matter what anybody else in the room thinks about what I'm doing, doesn't matter. Let the critics critic, because it's all about you. So Father, we just worship you, and we just thank you. You are worthy of it all. All our love, all our life, Father, you can have it all. And we just come with joyful hearts, ready to pour out our affection towards you, ready to grow, ready to take our relationship with you to a whole nother level. 
we love you. And we just want to just give you praise for what you've done and what you continue to do in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Woo! Say hi to somebody around you. God is good this morning. Thank you guys for being here. All right, good deal. Good to have Scott on the drums again. Come on, somebody. Yeah, devil can't win. All right. Amen. Yeah, and uh, for those of you visiting don't know Scott at all, he had uh, leukemia, uh, and... The doctor says he's a special case because uh, he doesn't have it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it like that. So, yeah, and uh, I love special cases. Amen. Because I think we're a church of special cases. Come on. You know, it's funny because now I want to preach off what Taylor started. You know what I mean? You know, part of the problem with having the word in you, you start building sermons over everything that happens. Amen. You know. I was like, hey, man, we could take off from that. I'm going to try to weave it in if I can, you know what I mean? And, you know, and then Megan going, you know, the broken pieces, and if you don't bring them, you know, you can't make that stained glass, you know, that. You know, and it's so true because what we try to sweep under the rug and do all those things, what can the Lord do with those things? But, yeah, he takes our lives, even though sometimes they're a mess. I mean, you know. Uh, he kind of puts them together and he makes what you did to destroy your life and he takes it and it becomes a testimony and it becomes something actually you can look at without shame and just go, that's who I was, but this is who Jesus is. And this is what he did, you know, for me, through me, in me, all those things. It's kind of like government of and for and by the people. It's like God of, for, and by whatever. He gets the glory. Amen? Amen. I love him. I don't know about you. Today's teaching, I'm going to tell you this right off. I'm just going to give it to you flat out. Take notes. I might not dance, scream, might not make you laugh today, but what you're going to learn today literally can change your life. It is seriously, seriously just part of the most important thing you can ever know. We're doing a series called Hold Fast because in the midst of trials, you need to hold fast, and we're talking about that and how we get victory. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, thank you that as uh, you place these things on my heart and I have these images of what you would like to accomplish, help me to communicate that. You said you would enrich me in everything, all utterance and all knowledge, all ability to speak and all ability to learn. I pray that for all of us in this room. Holy Spirit, you said you'd be the teacher, and so teach us today. And open up the eyes of understanding that we might know the hope of your calling and what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. And also, what is the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe? Whew, that same power that you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand in heavenly places. So, Lord, you give us victory, and we appreciate it, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. You know, 1 Peter 4, 12 says this, and we'll start off with this. And, you know, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial uh, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. And, you know, there's two people that want to know what's in your heart. And one is the devil. He wants to know how far he can push you. And God, he wants to know how much he can trust you. And, you know, he says he tried them in the desert to see what was in their heart. And so the Lord needs to know, can I trust you? The devil wants to know how far can I push you? Can I push you over the edge? You know what I mean? And so these trials come, and they'll work one of two things in you. Uh, but the Lord intends that they do something great. James 1, verse 2 says, count it all joy. <clears throat> you know what that word joy means? <laughs> exactly why it was translated this way. It means joy. <laughs> count it all joy. I mean, you think about that. That is the last thing I'm thinking when I'm going through a trial is yippee i a ki oh man, you know. <laughs> 
It's like, it's like, you know, I'm not thinking that, but when you have the proper perspective, and I hope that today's teaching gives you that perspective so that you understand how I'm going to release the kingdom of God into this situation and see God move. And it says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith. But this means this, proving it out or acting on my faith. I'm acting out my faith. I am putting my faith to work. That's what that means, that the testing of your faith produces patience. And a lot of people hate that word, right? I don't have patience. No, really, you do. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. If you're born again, you got a little bit of that in you, right? Come on. Faith, and through faith and patience, you inherit the promises of God. So it's part of that. You know, God wants that to work out, and you have the ability to do it if you will flow in the Spirit. If But now if you're going to live in the flesh, you probably won't have patience. And it's a good indicator. Am I being patient? I'm being spirit-led. Am I not patient? I am in the flesh. Pretty simple gauge, right? Yeah, this sermon's going over great. Man, Taylor... Come on, tell us about this jar thing. You know what I mean? People like that. You know, there's like, let's break some jars here, baby. You know, there must be a theme. You know, Megan's breaking glass. You're breaking, gla- you know, things. I should break dance or something up here. I don't know. Yeah. It says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Know that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have what I like to say perfecting work. That you might be mature. Boy, that's a word that a lot of people don't like. Mature and complete, (laughs) lacking nothing. In other words, the Lord's saying, grow up. But the way you're going to do that is is you're going to handle these trials the right way. And how many know little kids don't handle trials well? They cry, they whine. Listen, I ask you to take the garbage to the road. You're not going to die. It's like, if you'll just do it, it's going to take you like a minute, all right? I don't want to do that. You just, you're taking a one-minute task, and not only are you going to get punished, it's going to take you 10 minutes. I can see it now. I'm going to take the trash to the room. I'm going to do it. I can't believe I'm going to do this. you got to clean your room, literally. Okay, guys, cleaning your room, deal. 10-minute deal. You think mom's going to look in the corner of your closet? Heck no. Just put it all there. <laughs> Shut the door. Done. Man, awesome. Make the bed out of there. Go play. You know what I'm saying? Okay, I was the weird kid. My, my, my hangers were evenly spaced in my closet. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's sick. It's bad. Uh, the, the Lord had to fix me, okay? Yeah, made me not wash my car for a year. That's how bad it was. It was like, oh, yeah, just, oh, just quit laughing over there, somebody. You've got the same demon I had, I can tell right now. I like my cars really clean, you know what I mean? And the Lord says, that's an idol. And I went, and he's going, says, I don't want you to wash your car for a year. I'm like, you could, you could eat off my floor mats, man. It's like, I didn't even like my oil dirty. If the oil was dirty, I'd change it. <laughs> yeah, you learn not to use high detergent oil because it just gets dirty fast. Okay, never mind. Let's get back to the Bible. Okay, yeah. My wife's looking at me like, shut up, dude. Get into the word. All right. She would never say it that way. That's how I would say it. Okay. First, let's just get to the Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so I want to use this as an example of there's options. Okay, and so with every temptation, if you will look and if you'll ask the Lord, he will get you out of it and he'll give you a way out. All right. And you're going to be able to use your faith to conquer that sin if you will ask him and if you will take that way out. And so the Bible says that whatever is not a faith is sin. Sin is outside anything outside the, the perfect plan of God. And so if anybody says they don't have sin, they're a liar. So, you know. 
and that's what you know first john 1 9 says you know and 1 9 says so therefore can you know confess your sin he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness we come up short of the perfect plan of god it's called sin jesus paid the price for sin so that we could be born again amen but now we can conquer sin we can defeat sin and we can walk in the fullness of god galatians 5 tells us the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication. Well, we should probably just read it. Shall we go there? Let's go to Galatians. Let's go to Galatians. I'm not sure where I want to start, but, you know, 16 is a good place to start because I actually had that. But let me just... uh, Let me see. We got that one up there. Did I say Mark? Galatians 5. Yeah, gal- good. Because sometimes I just mess things up. And it's just the way that that works. Um, gosh, and then, see, I need a real Bible in my hands here. Cancel, cancel, cancel. Okay. Galatians 5, 16. You ready? I say, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Wow, that's pretty cool. So if I want to conquer the flesh, right? What do I do? Walk in the Spirit. But what do most people do? Condemn themselves so they stay in the flesh. Hide their brokenness so they stay in the flesh. I don't have a drinking problem. You know, <laughs> you know I'm fine. Almost every addict I know before they got free, oh, they were hiding it big. I don't have a problem. I'm just fine. Bro, when you sober up, let's talk about it again. You know what I mean? <laughs> you might not be, all right? Pornography, uh, yeah, very rarely do people bring that out in the open, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But if you want to get free, what do we do? You know, we, we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it is impossible, and I can show that to you today. That doesn't mean you're not going to go to heaven. It just means you will not inherit. You will not see the kingdom of God manifest, okay? Then it goes into, but the fruit of the Spirit and is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So there's this thing called the Spirit, and I can walk in this. And if I do walk in this, it says this. And those are, uh, it says there is no law against those. There's nothing to judge, in other words. If I walk in the Spirit, I can never sin by being led by the Spirit. If I live according to the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of my born-again spirit, I can't sin. There's nothing to judge. But if I live according to the flesh, there's always something to judge. And I can tell whether I'm in the flesh. It gave me a big description there. But anything outside of God's plan is sin. And if I'm outside of God's plan in any given area of my life, I can call that something that God doesn't want, or I can call that sin, right? So when something happens to me, maybe not even any fault of my own, but Satan brings something, but if I recognize it as something outside of the will of God, then I can have the proper attitude towards it. I can hate sickness. I can hate disease. I can hate pornography. I can hate you know, blah, 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 whatever it is, right? Because I have the proper attitude, because I have the heart of God. I want to live according to the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody. And so then I can have the proper response, which is submit to God, resist the devil. You got it, Jesse. Preach it, brother. I'm going to show you again the spirit, soul, and body little video that we made because I think we have to get this into us so much 
until we learn how to live life according to this understanding, okay? And so watch this little video. It's going to be four minutes, four or five minutes, whatever. Watch this, and we'll pick up from here. This is one of my favorite teachings because to understand this, you can start to understand how the kingdom of God works. How do we get our prayers answered? How do we walk in faith? 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says that the God of peace himself may sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This scripture, along with many others, talk about us being a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Now, we're very aware of our body and we're very aware of our soul. Our body is your earth suit that you live in. And, and we're very aware of that. Our soul, which is our mind, our will, and emotions, we're very much in contact with that as well. Uh, you study something, you learn, your mind grows, your will, your ability to discipline yourself, to accomplish things, your emotions, come on, you know, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. You're conscious that things convict you of what is right and what is wrong. And so we're very much in contact with these things. If I touch your body, you're going to feel it. If I poke you, you're going to feel that. If I contact your emotions through your words, if I call you a name or if I, you know, uh, speak lies about you, uh, maybe you look at the Internet too much and somebody's speaking lies about you, your emotions will feel sad. Or somebody comes in and goes, I'm so proud of you. You're the greatest. You make me happy every time I see you. Your emotions are going to feel really, really, really good. And so words are powerful. We can, the Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. And so when we speak words, they go and they touch our emotions. They touch other people's emotions. And so we're very much in contact with our body. We're very much in contact with our emotions and our mind and our will and our conscience, but we're not very aware of our spirit. Our spirit can only be touched through the Word of God, and we can only discover the the spirit through the Word of God. Well, much like, you know, the body, the Bible says in James 2, 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You see, the life-giving part of you is the spirit. And to understand that, we need to understand our spirit through the word of God. It says this in James 1, 23. It says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Okay, so, but it's talking about seeing your face in a mirror. If we're going to see our flesh, we, we look in a mirror, we see a reflection of who we are. We have never really seen our face. You might have seen the end of your nose, but that's about it. We've learned to trust the reflection of the mirror um, to represent who we are. You, you can't tell by your feelings if your hair is combed. You have to look in a mirror and to see if your hair is okay or if your makeup is okay. But the same thing with our spirit, to find out how we're doing spiritually, we need to look into the mirror of the Word of God, and the Word of God reflects who we are in the spirit. So you cannot tell who you are, you can't can't tell your condition spiritually without the Word of God. The Bible is our mirror by which we know who we are in the spirit. So to know who God created you to be, you have to know what the word of God says about you because the spirit man is the real you. So the the real you is your spirit. Now, we live in this earth suit. We need to take care of it. We need to eat right. We need to do these things. Our mind, our will, and our emotions, we need to read the Word of God. The Bible says to renew our mind through the Word of God that we might know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So to determine whether I'm going to be flesh-led or if I'm going to be spirit-led is determined by what my soul does. My soul through the word of God will turn towards the spirit if I will renew my mind to think like the word of God. And then my spirit can start to dominate my body and I will start to be spirit led. Those who are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. And the spirit of God leads me through my spirit, through the word of God, and then I can be spirit led. But if my mind is never renewed with the word of God, I'm always going to be led by my mind, my will, my emotions, and my flesh. My fleshly desires, 
for food, for whatever. And my mind will only think in line with whatever the world says is right and true. And my spirit will never be able to be in dominance. So this teaching about spirit, soul, and body, you contact the physical world through your body. You can feel that when it's touched, poked, whatever. It needs sleep. It needs food. You contact the intellectual world through your mind, your will, and your emotions. You interact with people. And you contact heaven through the spirit realm, and that is your spirit. Awesome. You know, the um, understanding this concept, because if you understand this concept that I connect with heaven through my spirit, I get born again in the spirit, and I'm one with God in the spirit, then I can start to understand where I need to do the work. And the work is in um, limiting my flesh to what it gets exposed to and renewing my mind with the word of God and putting that word in there to the point where it dominates my thinking. Now, if I don't do that, then I end up in trouble. And, uh, and I can not win. 1 John 2.16, if we can get the, okay, we got it up there. The, just listen to this, 1 John uh, 2, 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not uh, of the Father, but of this world. So it says the lust of the, oh, right there. And uh, let's go back to the spirit, soul, and body. And so, you know, the, what, what is of this world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's all in the soulish realm and in the flesh realm. You sit there and you got to look at that. The lust of the eyes, what am I seeing? And that puts a desire in me for things. That's why advertising works so well. They spend billions of dollars to get you to buy products. You know what I'm saying? And why? Because if they can get it before you, you can see yourself, you know, with that product or, you know, they'll even convince you you're not a real man or a real woman. You're not pretty. You're not good if you do not have or use this product. Right? Right? And, um, and so it's amazing what happens. And so that influence affects the way that we act, right? Sure does. Absolutely. You can't get away from it. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. You know, your flesh needs a lot of things, and it needs food. But there's times where you need to say, no food for you. (laughs) That's important. You know, Jesus fasted for 40 days, and he says, the spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and for 40 days he did not eat. You know, and it says that Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. See, I don't think it was just the three temptations that Jesus faced. I think Jesus was tempted the whole time. And the way that you conquer that is is you you get your flesh to the point where it thinks it's going to die. It doesn't care about anything else. You want to conquer lust fast until it ain't there no more. A lot of you dealing with pornography. Trust me, it's all over the internet. You're trapped by it, you know what I mean? Things like this. You got to be quick in your heart and in your mind to be able to, you know, uh, to be able to go, no, no, I don't allow that into my life. No. You know, even on my Facebook, these stupid ads come on. So I hit that little thing and go, you know, block, whatever that little thing is quick. Well, I don't want that junk on my Facebook page. You know what I mean? I don't want any of that stuff. There's, you know, uh, blah, TV programs, whatever, commercials, man. I blind my eyes, man, if we're watching a TV program. You know what I mean? So, so Taylor hooked me up with this little thing on my TV that I can watch things without commercials now. It's really cool, you know. <laughs> or I can at least fast forward them if they're on, you know, whatever. I'll record things and stuff. Why? Because commercials will kill you. Why? Wow, they're dealing with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. So I want to stay out of that realm as far as the way that I have a worldview. I need to have a biblical worldview so then I'm responding to life from the spirit. Does that make sense? And so I need to renew my mind with the word of God. 
Galatians said, you know, if I walk in the spirit, I'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So how do I do that? And how do I walk in faith? How do I walk in faith during a trial? You know, I, I, I really believe this, and I believe that most of life is mustard seed faith. Now, mustard seed faith, trust me, it is not in fear. It's not bad. You know what I mean? Oh, you only got mustard seed faith. Hey, dude, I got mustard seed faith. And the Bible says if you have seed, uh, faith as the seed of a, you know, size of a mustard seed, you can remove a mountain and a mulberry tree. Those are the two examples we have. The other example that we have of the, uh, of the mustard seed, it says it goes into the soil. And it takes time for that thing to grow. But eventually it becomes big and ne birds nest in it and things like that. And I think that that's the illustration that we need to look at. And most of life is mustard seed faith. What am I planting in my heart and what am I allowing to grow? Jesus talked about the soil being our heart. Whoop, our heart being the inner man. Okay. And, uh, and so the mind, you know, at that point, the will, the emotions, things like this. And it talks about, you know, when the Bible talks about heart, it's either talking about the hidden man, which is the mind, will, and the emotions, or your spirit. And so he says the word goes into your heart. And he talked about the different soils of the heart. And there was only one soil that produced fruit. And it was the one that did not have the cares of this world, didn't have the lust of this world, didn't have all those things. We're not going to teach on that, but this is the deal. The soil that worked is the one that had the least in it. Talked about cares of this world, lust for other things, all kinds of stuff that'll choke the word, right? Satan coming, distracting you. Distraction is something that'll just steal the word of God out of your heart. People in this age have a hard time taking 15 minutes out of a day to read their Bible. That's how busy our society has gotten. Did you know back in the day, they would sit on their porch for hours. Why? Because they didn't have TV. They might listen to the radio. Life was shorter. You know what I mean? People hung around the dinner table after the sun went down. Why? Because there wasn't lights on the horse, to, you know, to keep plowing. Now we work 24-7, baby. We're, we're stimulated to the time we go to bed, and then you can't sleep because your mind is going so much. That's a product of our society, and we need to be cautious of that. Colleen and I read stories or Bible things, and we like to read biographies, and we read stories. And right now we're reading about uh, miracles and healings that take place through this one ministry. That's how we go to bed. I want to think about these things. I want my mind thinking about the Word of God. And it helps me to cast the cares of this life over onto the Lord before I go to sleep because I don't want to be dreaming about the problems. I want to be dreaming and thinking about God when I go to sleep. So we take this, and it says to hold fast to your confession. How do I hold fast to the confession of my hope? For I, you know, my high priest is faithful, right? Well, here's the deal. I take the word of God, and my spirit, the Bible says uh, in Luke 4, it says that my spirit and his spirit are joined together. So my spirit is in one with the Lord. And so... When I'm going through a trial, count it all joy. Did we talk about James? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, right? So now how do I do that? And how do I hold fast? Come on, somebody. You think about it. If I can hold on to a bull for eight seconds, I could be rich. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Eight stinking seconds. Seems like anybody could do that, right? Uh, there's some real athletic cowboys that cannot do it, baby. You know what I'm saying? They work really hard to do it, and they can't do it. And how much less could I do it? Come on, somebody. Get me on a bull, never having done it before. You could, you could give me a billion dollars. You hold on to this thing for eight seconds, you got a billion dollars. The odds are I'm getting stomped on by a bull. You know what I mean? Or a, a clown is saving my life. Oh, that's really brilliant. Hey, man. Yeah. <laughs> I owe my life to a rodeo clown. Yippee, yay, yay. You know what I mean? And stuff like this, you know. But hey, <laughs> but I have something more sure and that is the word of God the promises of God are at yes and amen in Christ Jesus they cannot fail amen 
You know, when people pray for the sick, this is mustard seed faith. The majority of the time, like I said, most of your life is, is mustard seed faith. And so the kingdom of God, you know, he says, you lay hands on the sick and they will recover, Mark 16, right? My, my soul read that. My, my soul read that and I believe that and I chose, you know what, if I lay hands on the sick, they will recover, right? But do you know the word recover means a process of time? And so then I need to believe that. And so with a mustard seed of faith, man, I just got this little thing. It can grow. It can grow until I get that mountain moved. It can grow until that mulberry tree goes if I'll keep it in the soil, right? Come on, somebody. And so I need to do that and keep it going. You know what I mean? And, and then when I'm praying for somebody, right, if they will agree with me, we'll get the results. That's exactly what happened with Scott and I. You know, I mean, I was in the, in the hospital when he first, you know, when they were like thinking all this kind of stuff and praise God, I'm, I'm so glad that we were honored to be able to be there together and laid hands on him. And every time we talked, I go, I laid hands on you. I believe the healing noise is working in you. He goes, yes, it is. I had one thought this whole trial. I laid hands on you. Healing noise working in you. How many times did you hear that come out of my mouth? Several, you know, and it was like, Boom, and he was in agreement with it, yay. Now what people want is I'm gonna do the word mustard seed faith because I'm doing it, and then I, if I really have mustard seed faith, a little bit, I just have to have, to have the expectation that what I applied is coming to pass. Come on, I am tithing and honoring God, then I can expect X, Y, Z, right? I am sharing the gospel, I can expect, you know, whatever, whatever the you know, scripture promise may be, because all the promises are in him, yes and amen. That's a pretty bold promise from heaven. If he didn't give us a mechanism by which that could be manifest, he would be a liar. So if I'm not seeing the promises come to pass, I'm probably pulling up my seed or not watering it. Because through faith and patience, you will inherit the promises of God. And so what happens most of the time, you pray under the moment of the anointing and whatever, people get some relief, but then they go home and as soon as a, a, um, a symptom tries to attack them again, they don't know how to fight the fight of faith. They don't know how to resist what isn't of the kingdom of God. And there they submit to it and go, well, I guess it didn't work. And that's taking the mustard seed faith, pulling it out of the ground, right? Now, it's a process of time. Sometimes that's no fun. You know, I mean, literally, okay, uh, cancer comes to you, and if right now what you have is mustard seed faith, that's okay. Go to the doctor, do whatever they say. They'll keep you alive until that thing can come to pass. Come on, we talked about the other day. If you're dealing with things mentally, you know what I mean, and whatever, and you need some medication to just balance things out until you can get your mind under control or whatever so that you can't stand on the word of God, that's okay. Just get to the place where you can live in the spirit, and eventually you're going to come out the other end. We all need help. Sometimes we need a friend coming and talking to our reasoning. Mm. You got a minute? Can I just take a little journey here? Do it. The word of God says that Satan goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Taylor, can you just come on up here? And this is going to be so spur of the moment. And I'm going to make it as easy on you so you don't fail. <laughs> Stay right here. So let's say he's dealing with a trial, right? He's dealing with sickness. Okay, right now you're dealing with sickness, but you're not in real <laughs> life. Okay, good. So <laughs> Satan has to come and see who he can devour. Gosh, Lord, help me to do this. I see something in my brain. I'm not sure we're going to get it out. And so I'm the lion, and I'm going, hi, man. It looks you're, you're dealing with a How are you feeling? Horrible. Okay, yeah, you look horrible. <laughs> yeah. Did you pray about it? No, no, no you say yeah. yes. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, yes. okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. I told you. I'm making it as easy as I can on him. He just really needed to, like, keep his mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, you picked the wrong one. All right, yeah, yeah. I have uh, prayed about it. Thanks, okay, guys. yeah, yeah. And so the, the lion, okay, and I want you to notice, because I'm going to do two scenarios here, and they're going to sound very much alike. I know, I know a lot of people have been praying, and, you know, it just doesn't work, so... You know, make sure you take that NyQuil and all that other kind of stuff and whatever. But 
Yeah, I don't even know if God answers prayer anymore. I had that same thing, and I prayed, and, and it took six weeks. Yeah, you know, but good luck, you know, whatever. <laughs> okay, so now this side, devil, angel, okay, like a roaring lion, friend comes up, hey, Taylor, how you doing? You know, you look a little, maybe you're dealing with something? Yep. You are, okay. So you're not feeling very well right now, huh? You know, the Bible says if we pray, all the promises of God are yes and amen, that he answers every one of our prayers. Would you, do you believe that? I do. Yeah. Can we do that together? Let's do it. Okay, and so we do that. Asking the same questions, the roaring lion is just going to leave out the hope of the word working. But what somebody being led by the Spirit of God does will do this. Now, what some people try to do, we're going to get rid of that right now. Okay, and, if I, and I'll share with you how the gift of faith works. But if I don't have the gift of faith, I'm going to ruin his faith and mine. Sickness, get out of here right now. And, you know, and I could get all Pentecostal on him and you know, spit on him and all kinds of stuff, right? But if we're dealing with mustard seed faith, we have to understand it's a process. But if I fully believe the anointing is working in you, man, I'm going to be, yeah, I'll call you tomorrow, whatever. But you got to know, I am so fully standing on that's working in you. Because God said, if I lay hands on you, it's going to work. You believe that? Yep. All right, so you might as well start expecting getting better. And confessing it. And confessing it, right? And you know why? Because faith without works is dead. And the number one act of faith is words. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Okay? So that makes sense? And so the lion devouring you, Satan isn't going to come and like, hey, let's destroy your life. And you're going to go, okay, hey. He has to deceive you into it. He's called the deceiver. And he has to just maybe take hope away from you. And he starts to devour you. But a godly person will come in. And maybe you don't have hope. You're really feeling bad. But I'm going to give the word to you. And you know what? We're going towards hope. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> One test, bro. <laughs> One. That's all you had. Okay. <laughs> now, yeah, now, what people try to do when they hurt their faith is, is they try to do, get a miracle with mustard seed faith. And it will work, but you have to understand mustard seed faith has a process. Same result. But now the gifts of the Spirit, they come in by the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? So he comes with his gifts and he drops faith in you. And that's like, oh my gosh, right now, there's nothing can deny this from coming to pass. The first crippled person I saw healed was this gift. I've seen, I've seen people literally raised from the dead with mustard seed faith. But there, I saw an instantaneous miracle. There was crusades we've done. I've seen many others. I've seen instantaneous things. It's always the same. God drops something in. Now, if God gives me a gift of faith, as in this one case, this woman was crippled, and faith dropped into my heart, and I instantly had this overwhelming sense, I, whatever I say is going to come to pass, and I'm a steward of this right now, life and death are in power of the tongue. The Holy Spirit literally said to me, if you say die, she will die. And I knew instantly how Ananias and Sapphira died. It was the presence of the power. And if you, it's like electricity. Electricity doesn't care about you and how holy you are or unholy you are. You violate the laws of it, you will die. And if the power is present and you violate the laws, it can kill you. Because there's instant judgment. And I knew that whatever it said, would come to pass. I knew that if I said die, she would drop dead. And I said, be whole. And she popped and cracked and was totally made whole. That's a gift by the Spirit. And the Bible says to desire those gifts and it says to look for them, but too many times we don't. And we're trying to do gift of faith stuff with mustard seed. And I think if we get this understanding and how the kingdom works, we're going to be able to get our prayers answered better. We're going to be able to join into faith with others better. Come on, somebody. I'm going to go on a journey with you. We're going to do this together. And so let's put our faith in here. Let's keep confessing the word. Let's come on. But the problem is, is many times in the midst of a trial in your flesh, people are then trying to find what is a mustard seed. 
Many times I come to people and they're dealing with something that is life-threatening and I go, what scripture are you standing on? And they can't give me anything. People that have been Christians for 15 years can't give me a healing scripture. Why? They have not renewed their mind with the word of God. They have not found out who God is. They haven't found out who they are through the word of God. And then they're trying to get a harvest with no seed. With Scott, there was no hesitation. When Scott and I were, were in the hospital, absolutely, this is what it is, dog. No, no, this can't live. This can't stay in my body. This is, this is, boom, boom, boom. And we're both like in agreement. Why? We're quoting the same scriptures. We're doing the same things. Why? Because not only do we have one mustard seed, we planted several scriptures that produced seeds that we can pull on. In fact, maybe it, this would be a better example. I have, what are they, where, where do they store grain? What is that called? Silo. I have a silo that I get to pull from and go, let's do this. You can tell I'm not a farmer. I'd die. All right. You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> I need you farmers because I'm going to starve to death. All right. And uh, I'll kill a deer. We'll trade. We'll barter. Okay. So. And so will you pull from the resources of what you've stored up to be able to go, I can fight every attack. Why? Because I've got multiple weapons and I've got multiple seeds to be able to attack this thing with. But if I allow Satan to keep stealing that seed just a little bit, a little subtlety, I've seen people throw their lives away because they thought that they could get away with sin. Well, God's still using me. It's probably the most dangerous phrase I've ever heard in my life. Well, I'm saved by grace, so it doesn't really matter. No, it really matters. Because every time you're living outside of God's design and you keep accepting it, you're getting weaker and weaker and weaker. You're destroying your heart's ability to store more seed. So, to live a victorious Christian life, the word of God should be the center of your home. The phrase, what does the word of God say, should be coming out of your mouth a lot. When sickness commercials come on, you know what I mean, and we happen to hear it, Colleen and I go, not in our home, with long life we're satisfied, we don't allow any of that. What, what happens when a symptom comes on you and I'm saying, it's okay, man. I'm telling you what, you want some relief, take a night call, do whatever, things like this. But do not negate the word of God. Do not stop that. If you need relief to be able to meditate, you need relief to be able to do this. But also, hey, there's times when you shouldn't take the medication. Why? Because you need to just be standing. Amen? You know, it's rare that I'll do something uh, 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 on the medical side of things other than just building a healthy life, but you know what I'm saying? Because I want my first response to always be the word. And a lot of times I get my answer before I need the medication, before I need to even go see the doctor. Why? I have a storehouse of seed that I've planted. I probably have like 40 to 90 healing scriptures memorized or at least very familiar with. Love scriptures. I'm loved. God loves me. I'm his kid. In fact, the Bible says when I'm born again, my spirit is sealed with the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. That way I can't ruin it. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so no matter what, he loves me and I can walk in the love of God. And I know he's, you know, so when I break something, I don't have to hide it from him. I can bring it right to him and say, okay, we got another window we're making. And... Uh, <laughs> You know what I mean? Because <laughs> here we go. Amen. Because <laughs> I messed up again, you know. And can I share this with you? To grow into maturity in this soulish realm, there's some wounds so deep that sometimes it takes God years before he can bring it up. And you keep doing actions according to this broken heart, but it's okay because you're moving forward. And you might be one giant stained glass window by the time the whole thing's done. You know what I mean? You know, it's like a house of glass, right? Yeah, it's like, you know what I mean? 
And there's other people that, man, they just seem to conquer these things really good. Well, maybe they didn't have the soul wounds that you have. Maybe they grew up in this home where they didn't get their identity destroyed or, or they didn't have all these wounds, you know what I mean? Praise God. But you weren't so fortunate. But guess what? God's still going to make something really beautiful out of your life, and you get to allow those things to come up, and you allow to bring them out, and you go through the process you need to go through to be able to come out and be whole. And so don't be ashamed of those things. Come on. You're born again. You're sealed with God. But you've got to let those things come out so then God can build something out of them that's worthy of looking at. Amen? Amen. Folks, if you knew me before I was born again, you would not be in, want to be in this room right now. <laughs> I have no idea why my wife stayed with me. I have zero reason. It was God. It was God. She needed God. It was like, oh, you know, yeah, it's like... Yeah, it wasn't me, bro. <laughs> yeah. And I don't even hesitate to say it. I wouldn't have stayed married to me. Serious. Serious. Wouldn't have done it. But you know what? Our marriage now today is just a thing of beauty. More in love now than we ever have been. Because we didn't allow anything to be hidden. We just kept bringing it out, allowing the Lord and his word to deal with it. In relationships, stir up all that brokenness in you so that it can come to the surface, so then it can be dealt with. So let's quit judging ourselves according to our soul and our body. Judge ourselves according to the spirit. Renew our minds. Come on. So that we can start to live and walk out who God made us to be in the spirit. And it's okay. Because sometimes your journey might be a little longer, a little harder than somebody else. But you know what? The sooner you bring it out, and I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a whole lot more people that are going to be gathering around you and helping you than are going to be throwing you away and condemning you. But what does Satan do? He tries to isolate you and tell you you're not going to be accepted. Now, there's some sins that have to be dealt with in different ways. And it can look like judgment, but it's not. I've had to put people in jail before. For their safety and other people's safety. But in prison, they started to renew their mind. They couldn't function outside of prison, and they needed to be there. And that's okay. Amen? Amen. What if you need counseling? Don't be ashamed of it. As long as that counseling is bringing you to the identity of Christ. Right. Otherwise, it becomes a trap. Right. Amen? Amen? We're going to stop there. I think that gave you enough and a little bit of an understanding on how the kingdom of God works, how mustard seed faith works, how do you go through trials? You hold fast to what the word says until that mustard seed faith grows up and you come out the other end. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you for this time together. We appreciate it. We thank you. And I pray that your word goes deep into our hearts and we appreciate you and love you. And Lord, we can accomplish everything that you have for us through mustard seed faith. We can get everything that the gifts of the Spirit bring by mustard seed faith. We can touch the world with mustard seed faith. So, Lord, help us to walk these things out. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Boom. Oh, hey, there we go. Awesome. So there's connect cards in the backs of the seats. If you guys need anything for prayer or you have questions about the church, make sure you fill those out and drop them off. We have offering boxes throughout the entire church. Make sure you drop those cards in there or maybe you're giving your life to Christ for the first time. We want to connect with you. Um, as Pastor was going through this teaching, I was thinking about the scripture, how Jesus promised the disciples that he would not leave them as orphans. And orphans are children without a father, right? 
and or parents. And so he said that he would send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would come and bring everything that he spoke to our remembrance. And so I just think it's interesting going through the spirit, soul, and body teaching that we just heard that the Holy Spirit is also reinforcing in our minds, in our souls, what the Father has spoken through his word. And so I just love that. Um, Judah and Hannah and I, or our whole family, was at a fifth third ballpark game, and they had fireworks at the end of the thing. And little known fact about Judah is he's actually completely terrified of anything that explodes or makes that kind of a noise. And so, and the funny thing was they parked the fireworks right outside where we parked. And so we're bringing our son, and he's screaming. And it was just kind of cool because in that moment, I feel like the Lord dropped like a, a word just to speak to him. So I looked at him, and I was like, hey, buddy, just, just you know, these are the small fireworks. These are the little fireworks. And then he actually enjoyed the fireworks, and we've never had that happen before. But it was just kind of funny how, you know, I spoke as a father, and his perspective shifted, you know. And so I've, I just truly believe the father is speaking to us, and our perspective needs to shift the same way that my son's perspective shifts. And so it's just the small fireworks, guys. All right, let's move forward. And so I have a couple announcements for y'all just to go through. And the first one, sounds like I'm from the south today. Y'all, how y'all doing today? But uh, the first one is the men's tailgate overnight event is next Friday. And so come out and fellowship with us. We're, the event's going to start at 4 o'clock on Friday, but it goes to Saturday at 10 a.m. And so they just invite you to bring a camper out or a tent, or maybe you only want to go to one of those days instead of both of them. Just know you're invited to come out, and we'd love to connect with you. The next thing that we have is we have a missions trip to the Philippines on November 14th through the 26th. Yes, if you have not gone on a missions trip, I highly encourage every single person here to go on a missions trip. Ask the Lord, hey, should I grow? Yes, the answer is always yes. And we have a great sign up already happening, but we just encourage you to sign up. Um, there's a lot of names on there, but we want to bring a team of people, and you will not regret going to that trip. And Pastor Eric leads it and does a phenomenal job. So if you're interested, there's interest forms at Connections, and sign up. It does not mean that you're going if you sign the interest form. They just want to collect a list of people that are interested. The next one that we have is the Men's Bible Study is happening um, September 12th through November 14th, and if the cost is $20. You can also sign up for that at Connections, and the $20 gives you a t-shirt on top of it. So it's a win-win. And the series they're going through is Hot Topic. And so we're excited about that series. And there's also QR codes at Connections you can use as well. And then the last one we have is New Directions, which is our Wednesday night programs. We'll be starting on September 14th through October 26th. You do not want to miss this. So here's the cool thing. If you remember what we did last Wednesday with the previous New Directions, all the kids were allowed to break off into different things that they wanted to grow or be discipled in. And so this year we actually have some new things that they can go into. So if you have a kid or a child and you'd like to bring your family here, um, they have vocal training, they have drumming that will be taught, they have dance, jujitsu, and even cupcake decorating. Yes, thank you. It's just for children, Ben. Settle down. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Eric, Erica will be leading some of the cu cupcake decorating. That's almost a tongue twister. Pastor Paul was trying to say he was leading that on first service. Not the case. Erica will be doing that. And so the, for the adults during that time, there is a video series that we will be going through. If you want to get the book, I'm holding it up. The title is Have a New Kid by Friday. Every parent should say amen after that one. <sighs> Deep breath. Awesome. And so... This video series that we're going to go through is phenomenal, and Colleen and I were talking about it. You will laugh, you will enjoy, and you will grow through this. And so if you want to grab the book just as a extra, feel free to pick one up on Amazon. We might have a couple copies coming in within the next week, but you do not want to miss this. So there's something for the adults, there's something for the kids, and we invite you guys out. So thank you guys for coming and spending your Sunday with us. If you need prayer for anything, come on up. We appreciate you all. Have a great Sunday.